Tim always does such a wonderful job with the song service. Um, I probably couldn't. I don't know. I, I hear Roger say it as well. I don't know that I could pick out better songs to match the scripture and the sermon. Uh, the only challenge I have is getting it to him late occasionally. But uh, he always does a, a brilliant job, and I just appreciate it so, so much. If you are visiting, uh, as always, we want you to know that uh, you're an honored guest. And also, we want to uh, welcome those who are unable to be here this morning. Uh, we are glad that uh, you're able to make it tonight. And then uh, also, we want to welcome you who were here this morning and chose to come back tonight. Uh, we are fortunate uh, to have elders who set this side of time on Sunday evening uh, that we could have another opportunity to come worship and encourage each other in the faith and praise our God and Father uh, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, uh, and simultaneously encourage each other in this precious faith that we share. Hear me in the right way on this one. You know, worship is an interesting thing. Um, oftentimes we try to encourage people. We really do. We do all we can. Um, I know when I used to work with sports teams, I used to say this to the players to try to help them have the right attitude toward what they were doing is, you don't have to play a sport. You signed up and you get to play a sport. Now, if you hear that in the right vein, you understand what I'm saying. Well, it's the same true in worship. Now, I'm not talking about can't make it. That's not it. But we, we, we don't have to worship God. He doesn't make us worship him. The real facts are we get to worship him. We get to worship the almighty, true, living God as his children. Uh, and I don't know that it gets any better than that. I know for me, I, I, sometimes I've, I've felt uh, just a little... Uh, uh, Sunday evening, there's been a few times where I felt like I really, uh, I, I'll just confess, I, I like to take a nice nap on Sunday evening, and every once in a while, the nap is pretty deep, and to be fair, I could get about another two to three hours and miss, wouldn't miss a beat, but it's a uh, quarter till six, and Darlene's checking on me, and I really would like to roll over, probably if it wasn't worship, I probably would, but it's worship, and I want to come, and I want to worship God, and I want to be with you, and why? Because I need to be here. I know me, and I know the challenges I face, and I know that if I don't stay on target where I could end up, and I'm just grateful and thankful that you're here. So uh, when we look at uh, tonight, I want <clears throat> to thank you, first of all, for uh, being kind enough uh, to listen and encourage me in our look at Col Colossians. Uh, Colossians is, uh, like I said, every verse is almost a sermon in of itself. We tried to do an overview uh, and I want to appreciate uh, your attentiveness. So what I want to do this tonight is look at a few key themes, uh, look at kind of an introductory where we were, look at the passage, and then finish out and see what we have uh, to offer here. Um, so here's some key themes in the book. You might have heard some of this when uh, I was preaching. Uh, Jesus Christ is preeminent over all creation. He's Lord over all human rulers and cosmic powers. Uh, God has acted through Christ to secure redemption and reconciliation for all who put their faith in him and obey him. Uh, baptized believers are in Christ, and so they share in Christ's death, resurrection, new life, and his fullness. Christ has defeated the powers of darkness uh, on the cross. Christians share in his power and authority over that realm. Jesus is the fulfillment of the Jewish expectation. Christians share in the heritage of the old covenant people of God through their union with him which is revealed uh, the great mystery. Believers are called to grow in spiritual maturity by getting rid of sinful practices and developing Christian virtues. The church is encouraged to be steadfast in prayer and walk in wisdom. So Paul wrote this letter, says that he was an apostle by the will of God, apostle of Jesus Christ, and he wrote the letter to the brethren, the faithful brethren at Colossae, and he says it was from him and Timothy. Paul wrote the letter from Rome, 1,180 plus miles away. I have no idea how long it would take a letter back then to get that far, but I'm sure it was a, a while. Uh, but that's how far he sent it. His purpose was to encourage the faithful saints Exalting Christ in his church uh, above all else, especially uh, there was a her heresy uh, plaguing the church in Colossae, some type of Judy, 
Judaizers influence on the one hand, and then it seems to have some native beliefs and superstition on the other hand. And so his real purpose was Christ is all and in all. That they might understand that dying to sin means living for Christ. By faith and being baptized in him, obedience and allows them a two-way, watch this, allows them a two-way love relationship with God. Do you know that every person in the world has a one-way love relationship with God? Because he loved them that much that he sent his son. But for it to be a two-way, you have to activate faith and have obedience. And then all of a sudden, you become a child of God. And it's a game changer because all of life changes when it goes both ways. But before that, it's only one way. So when we were uh, two weeks ago, uh, our first uh, in the morning, we talked about Christ in you, the hope of glory. That was the mystery uh, to the Gentiles. In the PM, uh, we talked about as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. Walk in the faith that you came in. And then this morning, uh, we looked at uh, if you've been raised with Christ, seek the things above uh, where Christ is. Hopefully, uh, that is what our goal is or can be. I'm going to start off reading uh, out of the Gospel of John. Uh, it's one of my, I, I just love Sunday evenings uh, when Roger preaches on it. It's probably one of my default books. I probably go there more than anywhere else. But listen, listen to what John says in light of what we heard Paul write in the book of Colossians about who Jesus is. The true light which gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me, because he was before me. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. But grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at the Father's side. He has made him known to us. Another thing I do with, used to do with sports teams is we would set goals before the season started. And the idea was if you have a goal that you're working for with the proper attitude, you're more likely to achieve it. If you watch sports teams in America, whether it be Alabama, whoever wins a great tournament, even an individual golfer, if you listen closely, you'll hear something like this. If you, don't pay, if, if you don't listen or don't like sports, you won't hear it. They'll say something like this. They'll say, we can't believe that you won or we're shocked that you were able to pull it off. And somewhere in their interview, they'll say, well, actually, we set this goal before the season started. No one believed in it but us and our mothers. It wasn't an accident. It was a planned event. Now, here's what I say after we set the goal. If you and your family are going on vacation, let's just pick a wonderful spot, Myrtle Beach. Seems to be the mecca of North Americans up north. And you get halfway there and get a flat tire, what do you do? I can always tell what kids have been on vacation with their families and which one haven't because I, we didn't go on vacation. We went to funerals and weddings when I was a kid. That was our vacations, literally. But people who go on vacation know what I just said. What happens when you get a flat tire half the way? You fix it and get on down the road, is that right? Now watch this. Now the reason I ask them that is I know and you know in life somebody's going to have a flat tire sooner or later. The question is, are you going to fix it and get on down the road, or are you going to let it derail you from your destination? Easy on a vacation. Not so easy in serving the almighty true living God. Because here's the problem with flat tires. If we run over a nail, we go, man, I can't believe it. I just hope they can patch it. But if it's on the side of the wall, then I get to get a whole new tire, and hopefully I got the money, no big deal. But if you're driving somewhere you're not supposed to be, and somebody's vehicle you're not supposed to be in, and you get a flat tire, that's a game changer. Because now you have other problems going on with it. But here's what I want you to know about life. If you can learn to treat those two imposters the same, and fix the flat, recuperate your faith, and get back in the game, you will reach your destination. 
And what's our destination? Heaven. We want to live for the Lord now. We want to live life to the fullest that we can on this earth. And then hopefully, hopefully, he says in Colossians, that if we're faithful, we'll be found blameless in Christ. And that's our goal. So fix the tire and get on down the road, whatever that means. First point, continue steadfast in prayer. Our second point is going to be to walk in wisdom. And then our third point will simply be Paul's final greetings at the end of the chapter. Here's what Paul says. He starts off the letter with a prayer. It's amazing. Listen, listen to Paul's prayer. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love that you have for all the saints, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, of this you have heard before in the word of the truth, the gospel which has come to you, as indeed in the whole world is bearing fruit and increasing, as it also does among you since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth. Just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant, he is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf and has made known to us your love in the spirit. And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work, increasing in the knowledge of God. May you be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Paul loves to pray. Five times he lists prayer in this small letter. He tells them to continue steadfast in prayer. When you think about prayer, what do, you, what, what do you think? We sang the song, Jesus, what a friend we have in Jesus. We can take everything to him. He handles our struggles. He handles our challenges. Peter says, cast all your burdens on him for he cares for you. What, what do we really think about prayer? Here's the most important point. I've said this a million times, and I'll say it again. The most important part of prayer is who we pray to. Oh, I might mess up my words. I might not be able to get my thought out the way I want it at that time, whether I be in public or in private. But it's God whose undivided attention that I have to plead my cause to his caring, loving ear. It's been written that during this time period, that people probably pray less than they ever have. They say, because of all the things that we have going on in the world and how fast-paced our life is and how many things we do and how many things we watch and how many gadgets we have, that we have a very difficult time praying. It's not an indictment. It's just what they say. We have a hard time being still and knowing that God is God. We all have that challenge. I can remember uh, when I was single uh, that if my phone rang, I didn't care if I was in the shower. And this was before cell phones. I had to run across the floor, water everywhere, because I thought it might be a girl calling me. I didn't know. Then I got to a place in my life where I said, hey, wait a minute. Wait, whoa, whoa, whoa. I'm taking a shower. Enjoying the warm water, I don't have to get out and answer the phone. If they want to call me, they can call back. When Darlene and I first got married, if the phone rang while we were eating, guess what we would do? Answer it. Not so much all the time now. If it's a problem or an emergency, we'll hear it. Not that we don't want to talk to people. But sometimes you need moments to yourself, just quiet moments in this busy world in which we live. 
Continue steadfast in prayer. And then listen to what he says here. He says, being watchful in it, and then Paul uses this again, with thanksgiving. Just listen to the verse, just to get the meaning of thanksgiving. Here's what Paul says. We always thank God the Father for the Lord Jesus Christ when we pray for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints. Therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. Above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony, and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing praises and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Saturated with thankfulness. This is, uh, I wa- I'm going to go to Psalm uh, 50, and I, I want you to listen to this. We, we, we know a little bit about the Israelites and how they turned away from God and He was not happy with their sacrifices and all that neat stuff. I I want you to listen to what the psalmist writes through the Holy Spirit about their sacrifices to God and then God's response to them. Listen to this. The mighty one, God the Lord, speaks and summons the earth from the rising of the sun to its setting. Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God shines forth. Our God comes, he does not keep silence. Before him is a devouring fire, around him a mighty tempest. He calls to the heavens above and to the earth that we may judge his people, that he may judge his people. Gather to me my faithful ones who make a covenant with my sacrifice. The heavens declare his righteousness for God himself is judge. Hear, O my people, and I will speak. O Israel, I will testify against you. I am God, your God. Not for your sacrifices do I rebuke you. Your burnt offerings are continually before me. I will not accept a bull from your house or goats from your folds. For every beast of the forest is mine and the cattle on a thousand hills. I know all the birds of the hills and all that moves in the field is mine. If I were hungry, I would tell you. For the world and its fullness are mine. Do I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of goats? Here it is. Offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving and perform your vows to the Most High and call upon me in the day of trouble and I will deliver you and you shall glorify me. But to the wicked, God says, what right have you to recite my statutes or take my covenant on your lips? For you hate discipline and cast my words behind you. If you see a thief, you're pleased with him, and you keep company with adulterers. You give your mouth free reign for evil, and your tongue frames deceit. You sit and speak against your brother. You slander your own mother's son. These things you have done, and I have been silent. You thought I was like yourself, but now rebuke you and lay the charge before you. Mark this, you who forgot God, you who forget God lest I tear you apart and there be none to deliver. Now listen to this. The one who offers thanksgiving as his sacrifice glorifies me. To one who orders his way rightly, I will show salvation of God. If you think of all the sacrifices that they offered, and God says he wants a sacrifice of thanksgiving, appreciation. Isn't that kind of how our most wonderful relationships work? Don't we all just sometimes want to be appreciated? Somebody to appreciate something we did, even if it's our job, even if it's our responsibility. Sometimes don't we just want to be appreciated? Amazing. So here's what he says. He says, be watchful in it and be thanksgiving. And then he says, pray also for us that a door will be opened. Pray for missionaries 
Pray for those who are abounding to go in, whether it be our neighbors or around the world, to share the mystery of Christ. That's what Paul says. Pray for opportunities to share Christ. That God may open a door for the word to declare it. And then he says, why I'm in prison, he says that I might speak how I ought to speak. Now, here's an interesting thought. Paul's asking them to pray for him that he might speak how he ought to speak. How much different would our churches possibly be if every time a preacher stood up and made a mistake, if we went home and prayed for him? Amazing. That's what Paul says. Pray for me that I might speak as I ought to speak. Absolutely amazing. Paul seemingly always, always, always prayed. Now listen to this. This is what kind of blows me away about Paul. When you read Paul's letters to the Colossians, you read it to the Philippians, and he's talking about rejoice, rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Do you sometimes, like me, forget that Paul is in prison? I mean, don't you almost get the feeling that Paul was sitting on the back porch of a mansion on a deck with the sun setting and a cup of coffee in his hand, writing about all the wonderful things in life? No, not so. Paul is restricted. He can't go where he wants to go. He is on house arrest, so he can have visitors. And here's what the commentary says about Paul. Listen to this. Because of his preaching about the mystery of Christ, Paul was imprisoned. Elsewhere in Colossians, Paul alluded to his suffering related to imprisonment. He spoke of his imprisonment of bonds in Philippians, Colossians, Timothy, and Philemon. When he arrived in Rome, Paul was allowed for at least two years to stay by himself with the soldier who was guarding him. Although he was in chains and was guarded by a soldier, he had his own rented house. People freely stopped by to visit him. Paul switched in this verse from using we to saying I. The purpose for this seems to have been distinguished distinguish his condition from that of the others mentioned. The transition to singular was natural since he moved from what was common to himself and others what was peculiar to himself. Paul was in prison in Rome at this time because he, he, it was better to wait in prison to be tried by Caesar than to fall into the hands of the Jews who wanted to kill him. He had appealed to Caesar in order to remain under the protective custody of Roman government. After his appeal, he was sent bound to Rome this was his right as a Roman citizen. That's where Paul is when he writes to us to have to pray with thanksgiving. The next section he says, walk in wisdom toward outsiders making the best use of time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. Walk in wisdom towards outsiders. Another word for walk would be to live, how you conduct yourself. How we conduct ourselves and those who don't know the Lord carries a lot of weight because they read our epistle before they oftentimes will listen to our Lord's epistle. It's true. We do the same thing. When people talk or people say something, we wonder if they've done it. Watch this. I'll say this gingerly. If you've mastered something, whether it be business, whether it be a sport, or whether it be writing, and then you hear somebody wax eloquent on it that's never done it, do you know? Can a guy who's never fished talk for 30 minutes to the Hagues about fishing, and they not know that this guy's never fished in his life? If you think about something that you know and know well, and how many times have you heard that? I can remember the first time it hit me. I was 19 years old and I was playing tennis. And I had got pretty good, took lessons, was getting pretty good, starting to understand what my game was inside the game. And they came out with those new big rackets. Kids don't even know what I'm talking about. Believe it or not, the rackets back in the day used to be about this big. Now they're the size of screen door. But the sweet spot's as big as the old rackets used to be. 
But a guy one time when we went to look at new rackets said, oh, yeah, if you buy this new racket, uh, your game will improve dramatically and you'll do, do, do. you still got to hit the ball correctly. You still got to hit the ball correctly. But this guy was going to sell us a new racket because it was going to make us that much better just by buying the racket. And I thought, man, that's weird. But as I grew in life, and watch this, and I've been on the other end of that. Have you? Have you talked about something and didn't know an expert was in the room? <laughs> yeah, 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 it goes both ways. I said, okay, Harry, kind of hold yourself here. Talk what you know and what you don't know. Ask good questions. It's a good way to live. So Paul says that uh, they're to walk in wisdom toward outsiders. Remember in chapter 3, he told them how to behave themselves in the church. And then he told them how to behave themselves in their own household. And now he's telling them how to conduct themselves in the world, basically. He says, making the best use of time. Why? Because time is the one thing you don't get to get a reprieve on. You can't get a bonus back. We all only have so many minutes, and we don't know exactly what that means. Time. There was a time when I used to watch a lot of things. Now, I'm busy trying to live a lot of things. I watch some things, but I don't watch everything. Because life will pass you by in a heartbeat. He says, let your speech always be gracious. And then he says this, seasoned with salt. This is for one of my friends out here. Listen to me, I like mashed potatoes, I like baked potatoes, I like home fries, I like hash browns, I like casseroles, but every once in a while I just have to drive through McDonald's and get me some salty fries. I don't know if I like the fries or the salt and it really doesn't matter because I like them. I don't eat them every day, I don't eat them every week, but when I want some, I want some. And I like how they taste. See, salt in our generation gets a bad rap. Why? Because we have such an abundance of it, our challenge is not to eat too much. Back then, that wasn't the case. They didn't have that much salt. Salt was a big commodity. Remember Jesus? If the, you are the salt of the earth. If the salt has lost its saltiness, how is it going to be restored? It's good for nothing to be trampled under the foot and thrown away. That was Jesus' analogy, the value of salt. It's a good thing. We all understand what he's saying when he says, let your speech be seasoned with salt. So that you may know how you ought to answer every person. Here's a little taste test for speech. It's hard to uphold. I'm not saying I do it. I'm just trying to give you something to go with. Here, here you go. Is it true? Is it kind? Would I want it repeated? Is it helpful or hurtful? Would I want others to talk about me in the same way? And then listen to this one. Can I justify before Jesus in the day of judgment what I'm about to say? Mm. Talking about seasoning your conversation with salt. That's pretty good. Pretty, pretty good when you think about it. Why? Because the real facts are we all get it. Words are valuable. Words ideas rule the world and ideas are conveyed through words it's through the gospel that God chose to bring the world to him it could have done other ways it's through preaching foolishness to some stumbling block to the Jews foolishness to the Greeks but the power of God in Christ the power of the gospel the power of speech actually words have life Wisdom, in this small book, this small chap, this small little book here, is, believe it or not, he writes six times. Listen to what he says about wisdom. And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom. Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you and for those that lay out of sea and for all who have not seen me face to face that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, to reach all the riches of the full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ, 
in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom. And then he uses a negative connotation toward wisdom in chapter 2 when he's talking about who not to follow. And he says it this way. These have indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body, but they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. But they're trying to act like it's wisdom. And above all, put on, of all these things, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony, and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, so which you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom. And then the last one in, in our context, walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoning with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each one. So some of you, when I start talking about wisdom, automatically went to the book of James. Do you know what James says about wisdom? Listen to this. First, he talks about having trials and struggles. And James says, count that all joy. Because inside of the struggles and the challenges, God is perfecting you. And you're getting stronger. And you will get a peace. That's what James says. And then he says this. Listen to this. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God. Don't have to raise your hand. Think about all the things we pray for. often do we pray for wisdom now we used to say wisdom comes with age some of the older folks have wisdom i don't know that i go so far to say they all have it i mean just because you're older doesn't necessarily mean that you're wise we all would agree with that although there does seem to be something about people who are very um contemplative and has strong values that seem to have wisdom as they get older, but that's not just because they're older, it's because of the experiences they've had and reflection they've had and the thinking they've had. But James says, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given to him. Listen to this. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind, for that person must not suppose he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. What James is saying is to pray to God for something and then don't believe that God is going to bless you makes you an unstable person. Remember this morning when I said that if you can pray for it, you can have it, meaning if you can fall before God and ask him for it, and, and you've got a clear conscience with that, you pro it, there's probably nothing evil or contrary to the Christian life in pursuing it. But you still, you still have to pray. Pray for wisdom, he says. How awesome is that? To pray for wisdom when we think about it. So when you think about prayer, and we think about God and who he is, And you're probably like me. You probably see people and you say things like, um, oh, yeah, I knew you were going through a tough time and I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll keep you in my prayers. If you read online obituaries, they all say the same thing, which is a good thing. You're in my thoughts and prayers. I wonder sometimes if that's just a salutation for us. And I don't mean us like you indicting. I just mean as a people, I wonder if those are just things we say now. I wonder how different life would be if just this small group of people said we are going to start praying weekly and daily for God's word to be fruitful and multiply here in Marietta. I wonder if it would make a difference over time. There are people who pray when they get in trouble. Sometimes they're delivered. Do we keep and I don't mean a record like a checkoff sheet, but man, don't miss the opportunity to thank God for answering your prayers. At least the country dude said, thank God for unanswered prayers. He went back to his reunion, and I think he saw his girlfriend that he had in high school or something. I don't know. 
I assume that's what the song is. I haven't listened to the whole song. I probably should before I make a comment on it. But when you think about prayer, though, I, sometimes when I think on the things that I have prayed for and I look in my life and around my life, I am amazed. I hate to bring Darlene to this. People say all the time, how did you end up with somebody like Darlene? I said, you guys, I know. You know what I tell them? Same way you end up with your wife, I prayed for. I did. I sold Darlene the prayer card. She couldn't believe it. You know why she couldn't believe it? Because it was three years before we went on a date. I'm not suggesting that anybody else should do that. I'm only saying I did. I'm not saying that's how it works. I'm just saying that's what I did. Darlene looks at this and says, oh, baby, that's cute. And then she saw the date and had a fit. It was three years before we went on our first date. But she was engaged. What are you going to do? Now watch this. You'll say, oh, yeah, Harry, but you said, can you? Wait, watch this. There's a, to me, now I can't speak for you, but there's a difference to me between engagement and marriage. In America, there is. I know in the olden days, engagement was marriage. I worked in sales, and you don't get a commission check until the check clears the bank. Just the way it works. If you got paid on the assumption that everybody's going to buy, we'd all be rich. The real facts are there's a lot of people who are telling you they're going to buy tomorrow because they want you out of their office and they're going to buy anytime. So I learned that pretty quick. I was kind. I was gentle. I was happy for her. I told her, I said, Darlene, are you married yet? And she said, uh, no, I'm not. And I said, well, I hope things work out well for you. I did. Ask her. Call her up 30 days later. Did you get married yet? No, I didn't. But I said, I hope things work out well for you. I, I was sincere. I just wanted to know if I need to check her off or not. And I called her up. I don't know if I told you. I called her up and I said, Darlene, are you married yet? She says, no, but we broke up. And I said, great. I mean, I'm sorry. Are you okay? Because you never know who's doing the breaking up here, right? So I said, well, wait, are you all right? She said, yeah, 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 I'm all right. 30 days later, how are you? Who is this? Harry Ogletree, you know, the guy. Oh, yeah, Harry, how are you? I'm good, I'm good. You're good, good, yeah. It was about a year and a half later before we got to go on our first date. I don't know. Some things are just worth hanging in there for. At least you think they are. You think they are. But I will say this. I will say this, and I mean it sincerely. I, like you, thank my God for my wife and for my kids and for you that are here because you have impacted our life in a way spiritually that you will never know. But we are grateful and we are thankful. When I was on the road and Darlene used to come here by herself still being Catholic, you took her in, and she saw some people she knew and felt comfortable being here, even though I was in Phoenix and all over the country. Thankful? You better believe it. Utter it off? Yes, sir. You know, my brother said to me one time, I hope he doesn't hear this. It's a true story. <laughs> they asked me to pray when we're at home, when we eat a lot. So my brother says, Harry, you got to ask God for something. You just always thank him for everything. He means well. That's my brother. I love him. But I'd rather follow Paul. My brother didn't die on the cross. He's a great guy. Sent me to the Holy Lands. Thankfulness, folks, is a big, big deal to God. Let us just get a glimpse of that in our prayer life. Let us get a glimpse of that as we walk in wisdom with other people. And watch this. What would happen in your life if when something went wrong, you said, you know what, rather than complain or whine, I'm going to pray about it. Many of you know Darlene's department's leaving. They're going to Costa Rica. Companies do that all the time. But you know what we're thankful for? They're not leaving until March. We got ample time to pray, run through doors, hope that's the right one, by faith keep moving. Some people get a letter and get let go that day. You got to be thankful. You got to be prayerful. Why? Because you can't navigate this big world on your own. Not as a Christian, you can't. You can bump into things in the world and keep bumping like a pinball in a pinball machine, but not as God's people. 
God wants to send you somewhere. He wants you to do something. He wants you to be salt. He wants us to be light. That requires prayer. Good prayer. Good prayer. Question. When it comes to prayers, would you rather have somebody else pray for you or pray for yourself? Just ask him. Do you know that in some religious bodies that people paid money to have someone else pray for them? And that was Jesus' whole point. You have access to the Father through me. I don't know. Prayer. I don't know that we can ever talk enough about prayer. So I'm looking at my clock here, and it's kind of winding down, and I'm going to wrap up this way. In Colossians, at the end, uh, Paul has farewell and greetings. He says that, listen to Tychicus's resume. Listen to this resume. It says, I tell you all about my activities. Tychicus will tell you all about my activities. Listen to what Paul says. He is a beloved brother, a faithful minister, and a fellow servant in the Lord. You can't have a better resume. He said, I've sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are and that you may be encouraged in your heart. We want to keep you informed on what we're doing, but we want you to be encouraged in your heart, in your total being, so that you can serve the Lord. And then he says, Onesimus, our faithful brother, who is one of you from Colossae, goes down to Aristarchus. Remember, Aristarchus is the one who took them the gospel in the first part of the letter. He says, he greets you. And Mark, the cousin of Barnabas. And then he says this. These are the only men in the circumcision among my fellow workers for the kingdom of God, and they have been a comfort to me. What's he saying? Out of all the Jewish people and all the temples and all the synagogues, all the synagogues that Paul had been in, there's about four or five Jewish guys that were converted, and they were a comfort to him. And Paul kept on and had faith and didn't complain. Papyrus, who is one of you, a servant of Christ Jesus, greets you always struggling. Listen to this. Always struggling on your behalf in his prayers. The dude is struggling on their behalf. Why? Because he helped plant the church. He looks at them as his spiritual children. That you may stand mature and fully assured in all the will of God. That's what he struggles for in his prayers. My brothers and sisters to this day believe without a doubt that we have the spiritual foundation we have because our grandparents prayed for us and drug us to church. And I wouldn't trade my parents for anybody in the world. But my grandpa Pop and grandma May drug us to church and prayed for us. How awesome is that? And you've done the same thing. Some of you are in the same boat. He says he worked hard in Laodicea. Now there's a letter. Paul says you're supposed to give this letter to the Laodicea. If you read this, there's a letter that seems somehow we don't know where it is. He said in that letter you should get and read. No one seems to know what it is. And all the explanations don't do much better with it. So the best I can tell you is it's lost. He says, greet the brothers at Laodicea. There seems to be a young lady uh, named Nympha who has a church in her house. You're supposed to greet her. And then he says this, and say to Acrippus, see that you fulfill the ministry that you have received in the Lord. Wow, that's an eye-opener. I read that, man, and it hit me upside the head with a sledgehammer. See that you fulfill the ministry that you have received in the Lord. It's an eye-opener. And then he said this. I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. Remember my chains. Grace be with you. We almost forget that he's in prison. We almost forget about the great joy that he shows us. And yet Paul does. So in conclusion, my prayer and hope is that this overview has been as beneficial to you as it has been to me. Maybe this week, just quietly read or listen to the book of Colossians and multiply your learning experience simply because you've heard it preached four times now in two weeks. You will see things that I didn't. You will understand things that I didn't bring out, but it will multiply your understanding and your learning curve. If you've yet to publicly acknowledge your faith in Christ Jesus, why not tonight? By faith, being buried with him in baptism to rise and walk in a new life, exercising your right to become a child of God. John 1, 12, Colossians 2, 12. If not tonight,
perhaps maybe sometime during the week. Just don't delay. Here's what I know. I don't know anyone who became a child or a daughter of God who wished they'd have done it later in life. Not one faithful Christian says, I wish I would have waited until later. If we can help you in any way, please come forward as we stand and sing this song of invitation.